delighted to be with you here again. It's Mentor Ate, and I want to welcome you. In today's session, I'm going to be doing something slightly different. I'm going to answer questions. I'm going to um, go through a number of questions that I've received um, from various people, and I'm going to try my best to give um, a very honest opinion and my answers to some of the questions. Um, in the short time that we have, I'm going to try not to go into the detail um, as to how I've come about with the answers or why I'm giving such opinions and views, but I'll do my best uh, to see how much I can cover in the short time that we have. Now, the first question that I'm going to try and answer is the question that most people have asked, and how do I get my ideal job? Um, which I think is a great question. And interestingly, I don't know where um, you are right now, where you find yourself today, but that wasn't a question that I had answers to when I started my journey um, within the corporate world. I left school having studied and I jumped right straight into working. But the leap that I took was so great and so huge there were so many things I just didn't know. I, I like to think of my early working career as, as being one that I had a lot of uh, ignorance. I lived from a place of ignorance without knowing so much. And obviously, I learned along the way. I love what someone once said. They said, um, experience is simply a result of good judgment. But good judgment comes from um, making poor and bad decisions, which lead to failure. So it's like a, a loop. You go from making bad decisions and wrong decisions, but if you learn from them, they become what we call your experiences. Your experiences then lead you into making the right choices and the right decisions, then it becomes success. So failure and success are like um, opposite ends of the same um, coin, one being the heads and the other being the tail. Now, how do you get your ideal job? That's a great question. To answer the question, let me start by making some qualifications. I'm going to assume that you are um, competent in what you're applying for. I'll put that to the side. I'll put competence to one side. Um, I'm going to assume that there are other applicants for the same job and there is a demand um, for the same position that you're applying for. Now, in giving you my answer, I'm giving you my answer from the opposite end. In other words, from a business leader's point of view, from someone who has been a, a manager, leader, um, interviewing for a candidate, what would I look for? What would I um, consider to be worth remembering? And that's the key point. Putting technical competence to one side, the question you have to have in mind is this. In every interview, you have to remember that it's all about emotions. We are emotional beings, we're emotional creatures. Um, people remember you based on how they feel about you. Obviously, you have to be competent at the job, but if you have 10 candidates applying for the same job, the one who can grab attention, the one who can get attention and hold the attention of the interviewer or the panel of, of interviewers is the one that is most likely to get the job. So if you're applying for your ideal job, there are a few things you must take into consideration. Number one, there's a company and that company has a vision. There is also the leader or the manager who is going to be responsible for ensuring that you um, abide and you work in alignment with the company's values and vision so that the company can achieve its goals. Now you have to separate both. And then finally, there's you. So going into your interview, assuming this is a face-to-face -face interview, one of the first things you must do if you want to get your ideal job is you, you have to have a good understanding about the company. There's nothing as um, sad as having a candidate in front of you who knows nothing about the company they are applying for. Now, how can you say you want to work 
for a company, but you don't understand the company's values. You don't understand the company's vision, you pe but you don't even understand the company's history. So the first thing I would suggest that you, you do is study. Find out a little bit about the company. And the reason is simply so that you can be interesting and so you can seem and come across as interested in the company. Very important. You want to seem in interesting, but you want to show that you're also very interested. Um, two candidates, both technically great, both having the right skills, but one of them has studied the company, knows about the leaders, knows about when the company started, knows about the company's vision, understands perhaps the few projects and the things the company has done lately, that individual will stand out. And this is the point. Every employee is an ambassador to the company. In other words, every company is looking for someone who can represent them. And your, your knowledge about the company at the interviewing process demonstrates that you have an interest far beyond your personal needs. So the first thing I'll say is understand the business, their history, their vision, and their values. Now, when you've understood those three, it's very easy for you to, even before the interview, decide whether it's your ideal job. In other words, do your values and the company's values come together nicely? So first things first, understand the company. Now, the second point I'll make is, it's always an advantage if you have an understanding about who is going to be interviewing you. We live in a social world today. 10, 15 years ago, you couldn't get any information about the person interviewing you. It's so easy today. In other words, if you apply for a job and you've been asked to come for an interview, there's nothing wrong in asking who is going to be interviewing me. Get the name. Now, they might ask you, why do you want to know? And you might just say, you know, I like to um, be able to walk in and address them by their first name so that it's more personal. Now, the reason you're ask, asking this question is not because you want to be able to meet and greet. No, the reason you're asking this question is because you want to do some research before you arrive for the interview. In the social world we live in now, it's easy to take someone's name. For example, you can take my first name and my last name. You can go on Instagram. You can go on Facebook. You can go on Twitter. You can go on YouTube. You can go on Google and it will pull up some information about me. So you have an idea about who I am even before I've even had the opportunity to meet you. So social media is not just about socializing, it's about collecting data, gathering data to help you achieve your dreams and goals. So one of the things I'll suggest you do is find out who's going to be interviewing you and then do some study on them. Now you're not studying them to find out everything about them. What you want to find out is this. What are their hobbies? Um, for many of us, depending on the kind of person you are, work, we wear a persona. Outside work, we wear a different persona. Now, some people are very neutral. They can wear the same persona, so they're very authentic. But understand there's a culture when it comes to working and outside work, you want to be free. So most people have a life outside work and you want to find out what their hobbies are. Not so that you can be fake, no. You want to sound interesting, but also you want to show that you're interested. I'll give you a good example. If um, I have a number of hobbies, I was, if I was interviewing you for a job, for example, and for whatever reason, you said you had an interest in martial arts. Now we have something to talk about. Um, that registers in my memory. Now, if you perhaps said, you know, I love karate, or I love taekwondo, I love kickboxing, or I love MMA, and I practice, and I'm a competitive athlete, what that suggests to me as an interviewer is, you, we have something in common. Now, if I'm going to be your line manager, 
we have something in common. Number one, you understand discipline. You understand the importance of habits, routines, rituals. You understand the arts. So within a working context, you don't have a problem following direction and orders and instructions. Now, you don't want to come across as fake. It's going to be authentic. Now, even if you don't practice martial arts, you might ask and say you have an interest in watching um, and that you admire people who um, are active participants. Again, what that demonstrates is an interest. So, if I had 10 candidates and all of them were technically good, but one of them connected with me on the emotional level. Remember what I said at the start is about emotions. You're trying to get attention and you're trying to hold attention. The person who stands out in my mind, the one I remember, would probably be the one who resonated with me based on commonality. Now, one of the things most people do not realize is every interviewer, um, in most cases, will often choose someone who has something they have in common with. I'm not suggesting that that's right. I believe personally that you want to have a variety of various personalities, bringing people with different skill sets, different views, different personalities. But subconsciously, we tend to um, go for people that we believe are similar to us. So if you're trying to get your ideal job, you have to connect emotionally. And I would say, do some research and find out what your interviewer is into. Now, you might also say, I like yoga. We have something in common. You might say, I love dancing. We have something in common. Now, you might be picking out various hobbies that I enjoy. Um, and if you have the same hobbies, we have something to talk about once we're finished with the formality of the interviewing process. I might ask you, well, how regularly do you train? Where do you go dancing? What style? What form? Um, do you do it you know, professionally or um, semi-professionally? We're connecting. So we're, we're having what we call rapport. Once there is rapport, you're getting attention. You've got my attention. In an interviewing process, remember this, style and appearance comes before substance. People would see first and hear before they know what's within you. So the point I'm making is get to know a little bit about who might be interviewing you so that you can come across as interesting and interested. Now, putting that to one side, well, let's talk about you. I'm, I met, made mention of something a few seconds ago when I said style comes before substance. Um, appearance comes before substance. So here is my view. Um, people would see first. We have sensory faculties. Sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. People are not going to touch you. They're not going to taste you. Um, they're not really going to smell you, per se. They might, if you're wearing a good fragrance, they might remember that. But what the, one of the two senses we use in the interviewing process is sight and sound. How do you look? Appearance matters. Um, I heard someone um, once say in a book that uh, Appearance is, in most cases, close to 100% when it comes to um, hiring people. I don't know how true that is because that varies depending on the industry you're in. But, you know, if you come into an interview looking well-dressed, well-groomed, you already have set yourself up because emotionally, strangely for some companies, the interviewing process takes a while. You know, they might interview, interview you on a Monday, but perhaps they don't make a decision until a Friday. So it's less about what you say in the interview. It's more about how they remember you. So how you groom yourself and how you style yourself is very important. You want to come across 
visually attractive. And I don't mean that in a sexual way. I mean that in a way of uh, it's appealing to the eyes. Your choice of clothing, your style, um, but more importantly, your approach, your demeanor, um, how you flow, your choice of words, your timing, all of these are important. Now, push that to one side and let's get down to what you have to say. Now they've seen, it's about what you say next. And here is my view. Assuming you've gone through the traditional process of uh, submitting a, a CV with your experiences, if you have any, then recognize something. Most experienced leaders, business managers, directors, CEOs, operators, uh, recognize that in many cases, especially if you have an advance up until a level of being a, maybe a senior manager or director or a vice president or whatever that might be, for people who are still in the, in the transition phase in their career, about 70% of what people put in CVs are incorrect. We, we, they're fudged. We, we, we tend to want to come across as good. So we, we say more than we've done. Um, we put in more words to make it look really interesting. We talk about products and projects and services and things we've done. Not suggesting that you weren't part of it, but we tend to make it look as though we did everything. So we try to make ourselves to look good. Now, most experienced interviewers understand that the CV is, contains about 70% um, of things that are not perhaps completely true. So put that to one side and recognize that your ability to control the conversation sets you up for you to be remembered. Every interviewing process has a lead and has a follower. Recognize this. You have a choice. You can make a choice. You can choose to be in control, but in a very gentle way. Now, by being in control, I'm not saying hijack the interview because the company is there to find out about you. But here is the key. Rather than let the company or the interviewer dictate the choice of questions, you can use a little bit of psychology whereby you're the one instigating the direction of flow of the questions. I'll give you a good example. Let's say perhaps you have had two or three years of experience and on your CV, you've identified those two or three years of experience, but to make the CV look good, um, let's assume 70% of your time was spent in an area of your strength 30% will spend doing perhaps things that you weren't really great at. Rather than let the interviewers dictate the questions by asking you questions on those 30%, you can choose to, in a way, gently guide the interviewing process so that the focus is on the areas where you feel strong, where you can respond, where you can talk about things that you know. And that's what I mean by you trying to control the interview. I have a recommendation. There are two parts to an interviewing process. There is the technical part where they're trying to find out whether you're technically competent, but also there is um, what I call the emotional part, where they're trying to find out whether your values align with the company's values. They want to find out whether you're a good fit to the team, whether you're going to get along with people, whether you're going to get along with them or your manager. That deals with more of the people side. There's the competence side and there's the, the people side. What I call capabilities. You have to separate both. However, this is the point and this is the key. Depending on the, the, the level you're applying for in a company, every company recognizes and understands that they have to train you. You're not the finished article yet. Now this applies even if you are at director level, um, senior director level, vice president, the company still has to train you. In other words, whoever you've worked for before, your experience, um, the knowledge you have is welcomed, but you're not expected 
to run your position. You're not expected to do your new job like you did your last. Why? Two separate companies, perhaps two different values, and of course, two different visions. So the company has to perhaps guide you into understanding who they are. They have to train you. And for that reason, your technical ability is normally seen as an entry level requirement. Um, as you move up the career ladder, what you find is it's more about emotional intelligence. It's more about how you get along with people. Can you sell? Can you lead? Can you communicate? Can you negotiate? Can you manage time? Can you manage other people? Um, do you set goals? Are you able to make decisions quickly and the right decisions? Are you able to perhaps uh, represent and be a good ambassador to the company? It's less about the technical, the more up you go in the career ladder. So depending on what level you're in, just bear that in mind. It's less about technical ability. However, because the interviewing process has two parts, the technical ability, because they want to make sure you can do the job. You have a choice. And here is my recommendation. If I had to choose for you, I would suggest that you rotate and you displace the order of questioning. And I'll explain what I mean by that. In every um, job interview, it normally begins with a technical side. What have you done? What experience do you have? What did you do? Can you explain? It's technical. And then towards the end, they might go into more of the people side, the capability side, your values, your vision, where you see yourself, get along with people. They might ask you questions such as how um, have you worked with or led um, people in difficult situations. Now they're getting into the people side. But because we're emotional people, you want to bring the emotions to the front to your advantage and let the technical be what you discuss later on. Now, how can you do this? It's very easy. Let's assume you walk into an interview and perhaps there are two interviewers or three, perhaps even four, who knows? You walk in, you introduce yourself, you say hello, you, you tell them what you know, um, a little bit about the business. Don't go talking about the whole business. You might just simply say, I'm really honored and I'm um, excited at the opportunity. I follow the business for a while. I know your vision, I know your values and it's something that I believe in. It corresponds with my values and I, I look forward to answering your questions. And um, I think this should be a great session and you get to know a little bit about me. You might just give that as an opening statement, but here is the point now. You've set the scene. You don't want to be passive and you know walk into an interview and sit down and wait for the questions. And then you're reacting. The key here is this. There are two ways to live. You can react or you can respond. If you react, it means the external circumstance, the event or the people or the person is in control. So you have to react to what they do. Now, responding comes from a place of prior planning. What we're doing now is preparing you and planning in advance. So going in into an interview, you have to have a strategy. You have to even have more than one strategy. You introduce yourself and you realize the format is different. They want to start with questions first. You change your strategy. You don't, you've got to be flexible and adaptable, but planning and preparation in advance means that you're able to now respond rather than react. So here is my take and my view. There are some buzzwords that you have to lay on the line early on in the process to get the attention of the person or the people interviewing you. If you can drop these buzzwords, the technical side and your shortcomings are overlooked. It's psychology. It's just understanding human behavior. It's about emotions. Now, every single leader or line manager is looking for good followers. They have a responsibility to lead, but they want people who can follow and people they can inspire to follow. So here are some buzzwords you can put in there as you start. Now you could sit down and say, listen, I'm, you introduce yourself, 
you say you're glad at the opportunity and you you know you relish the questions coming so you can answer them um to take control you could start by saying i like to just say a few things about me um, and who as a person and then i'll be happy to answer your questions now most interviewers will say yeah go ahead start by talking about your your philosophy but not in the point of view of trying to teach them or educate them you might say things such as um, from my previous ex experience and my previous employment um, i've had some great reviews on my attitude towards work but also my attitude towards my other colleagues and i just want to say to you that um, i know an hour 30 minutes is not enough time to get to know me but this is who i am i'm the kind of person who you will never have to give an instruction more than once boom that's a buzzword and here is the point if you've been in a position where you manage a team of people of various um, age groups which i have you know ranging from you know the teens 18 19 up to you know 50 and 55 one of the things you find very quickly is we're all different and what um, inspires and motivates and intrigues each person is different so you need to have a different leadership style to everyone but here is the point every line manager every leader dreads having a follower that is so slow they have to keep telling them what to do they dread it and the reason is simple recognize that in business you're there to solve problems and the difficulty of the problems you solve decides the level of compensation you get very important point your line manager perhaps is responsible for solving a problem on this level you might be responsible for solving a problem in this level now at this your level you might be paid 20 pounds per hour that's what you're paid at his level or her level it could be 200 pounds an hour now the level of focus required at this level is huge what the line manager needs is people who can support them if they have to come down and invest their time which is worth 200 pounds per hour down to your level which is what 20 pounds an hour they're losing money for the company but also is distracting them and is breaking their focus because now they have to come down to your level to remind you of something that you should have done they dread it every leader every line manager dreads it what we're looking for is we're looking for players and team players people who you give an instruction once they remember it they do it so you starting by saying listen I'm the kind of person you don't have to tell me twice on what to do give me a first instruction i'm very good i document it i don't rely on my memory i document it second buzzword you never have to ask for feedback because i'm the kind of person who once i've documented it i give you a timeline i tell you when i'm going to finish it and i give you updates now that is great why because in a business scene there is nothing more painful as having someone um, complete a task. Uh, the best way to put it is there's nothing so tragic as doing something so well that need not be done in the first place. In other words, effectiveness and efficiency are two different things. Efficiency deals with doing things right. Effectiveness deals with doing right things. So what managers and leaders are looking for are people who, if they give an instruction and the, the employee goes away and starts to work on it, there's nothing as painful as coming back after seven hours and what you've done is completely different to what you were asked to do. So that feedback process, without letting your manager come down to your position, you go up and say, I've done 25%, is this good? Am I doing it in the right way? Is this what you want? It's amazing. That's a buzzword. Now let me give you a third buzzword. Perhaps this might help. If you say something like, um, I'm very easy um, to be corrected. You know, I love corrections. I thrive on corrections. Um, 
but make it in a way that you're not saying I make mistakes. You're simply saying I welcome corrections. A lot of companies struggle with employees who cannot take feedback. Um, leaders dread having people who they cannot really tell them what they're doing wrong um, because they're worried that the people will get so emotionally attached to the words and um, perhaps will call in sick and take a few weeks off because they're depressed. By saying, listen, I love feedback. You can correct me as, you, as much as you want to and I'll take the feedback you've given me and I'll improve on it. Powerful, buzzword. But also you can take it a step further and say, but also in addition to feedback, you know, I know a little bit about you and I'll be more than happy for any of you here to, to mentor me. In other words, you're saying, I'm great at being a mentee. I'm great at being a, being a protege and I'm happy to learn from you. And what you're suggesting to them now is this, legacy. Without saying it, you're saying to them, you can pass your legacy onto me. These are buzzwords. Remember this, that in most companies, most uh, people who work and who are leading people, they might have a family outside. Their family may not be interested in the business. So for a lot of people, everything they learn professionally at the end of retirement, very few of them pass it on to someone who is a true protege or a true mentee. Very few. So you suggesting, I'll be happy for you to mentor me, is simply saying, we can have a relationship. Now they're thinking about, okay, I've got someone that I can, I can share my experiences with. Now, I'm not going to go into so many of buzzwords, but think about buzzwords, because those buzzwords will depend on the company and the industry you're applying to and where you're hoping to get your ideal job. Now, why have I suggested that you bring in all of these first? Very simple. Emotions. We are emotional people. Um, when you walk away from the interview, it's about how you are remembered. People say, how did I feel? Um, people say, well, I think there was chemistry. I think, I think, you know, he will fit in well. Let me put it this way to you. And, and I've done that so many times. Leaders and managers or interviewers will find reasons. Even if you're not the most qualified, if they connect with you emotionally, they will find reasons to support your recommendation for the position. You might have two people, one person incredibly technically competent, maybe better than you, but lacking in emotional intelligence. And you, on the other hand, you have great connection, you have rapport, you have a, a way of connecting in such a way that the person sees in you what they see in themselves. That is a spark. That is a buzzword. It gets them thinking this might be the person for the job. Now, once you've said that, you don't want to make a long speech. You want to keep it very brief, very simple. It might take no more than 90 seconds or two minutes at the most in what you say. But what you've done at that point is you've set up the emotional game in such a way that they come across softer than they would have. Um, some interviewers are weird. They get a buzz of um, making the interviewee feel they're not competent enough. And then they offer them the job, which is kind of weird and strange. But by changing the, the sequence from, let's start with the emotional before we do the technical, what you do, you soften the landscape so that the questions can now come and you can stare the questions in your direction. Now, once you've said that, you can go into the technical side. When you're asked technical questions, answer the questions straight. Don't beat around the bush. Don't try to make yourself look impressive. But here is the key. Talk about three things. What you did right, what you did differently, or what you would have done differently if you had the opportunity to do it again based on what you learned and how you passed and used that learning experience at the next stage in your career. That is so powerful because you see, every day we're growing, we're learning. 
But growth and progress are two separate things. Growth, in many cases, naturally, from nature, growth is automatic. Progress, on the other hand, is a choice. The difference between progress and growth is progress is you making a, a decision to stand back and find what you could have done better. Look at what you've done, study what you could have done better, identify it, and then course correct. Take the feedback and the next day, try and do better. Some people call it deliberate practice, which is practice with the intent of getting better. Now, by using such words, what you're suggesting is, I'm a learner. I'm not perfect in what I do, but even when I do a great job, I always find a way to do it better. So when you start talking about the technical side, be straightforward. If there's something you don't know, tell them you don't know it. Tell them you don't know it. But here is the key. Tell them in such a way that you're saying, I don't have the experience. Um, I, th I once had, did an interview with someone where they couldn't answer the question. But they said something to me, to me that I thought was quite unique. They said, I haven't done it before. I don't have the experience. But one thing I do know, the kind of person that I am, if I'm put in a position where I find a difficulty such as that, I'm the kind of person who will go and seek and find the answers. And he, he said... If you ask me a question that I don't have a clue about and you're my line manager, I can guarantee you something. If you give me half an hour, if you give me two hours, I'll come back to you with the answer because I have a passion for learning and I will find someone who knows the answer. That way I learn, but also that way I satisfy your request, which I thought was quite unique. So you're not expected to know everything. What you have to do is show you're human or show that you're a learning human being and someone who likes to grow. Now, once you've gone through the emotional side and you've done with the technical side, you've sort of brought the interview to the end, to the, to the, to the, to the conclusion. But during the technical side, here is the point. Keep the discussion around your areas of strength and competence. In other words, don't let the interviewer randomly select questions um, be the person who in a way you it's like planting a seed in someone's mind you suggest a topic based on your experience but also based on something you know a lot about so that the center of discussion focuses on that area now there have been times when I've um, been in interviews and I've seen this done beautifully well. The person may have had a career of 15, 20 years, done so many great projects. There's so much to ask about, but the individual has focused on one particular project. And that project is what he has a passion for, she has a passion for, and that's all we talk about. They're using their strength, their experience, to, in a way, guide the interview. And in that process, I mean, I'm fine. I can see the process happening. I can see the game being played, but I'm enjoying it because it's about trying to find out more about the individual. Now, you might ask the interviewer, you know, break the pattern and ask a different question, but here is the point. You, as the interviewee, you have to try and control the pace and you must try and control the direction of the flow of questions and answers. Now, those are my thoughts. I hope, I hope it's been useful. I hope you found something in there. The final part of what I would suggest is, is how you bring everything to a close. Um, at the end of every interview process, there is nothing wrong with um, asking some direct questions. Questions such as, you know, when do you guys intend to make a decision? Do you have a, a timeline? Because there's nothing more frustrating as sitting down and waiting for that email, waiting for that telephone call. 
So ask questions, you know, when do you, when are you looking to fill the position? Um, when are you looking to have the person start? Um, you might ask questions such as, are there any other, and how many other candidates are applying? Or is this position still open? So you want to find out all about that. So that as you walk away from the interview, you have some knowledge beyond um, what you have in your mind, which in no most cases is normally speculation and you just, your opinions. You want to ask direct questions. That way you can gauge um, how to manage your mind. That's the point. It's about managing your mind. And there's nothing wrong in you know asking for feedback. You might do the feedback afterwards, but whilst you're there, you know there's nothing wrong with asking for feedback. In 1954, I don't 54, um, 64, something in that region. Um, Connell Sanders had got into an age of retirement. Effectively, he had retired. He had received his social security check and the amount was so small and he had this small restaurant but unfortunately there was going to be a, a bypass and the infrastructure was going to affect his business so he decided to um, get in his car at the age of retirement and he started traveling from city to city trying to sell his recipe now Connell Sanders is who we call KFC um, he's the founder of KFC as he traveled to different cities, every time he went into um, a business, a restaurant, and said, listen, I have a great chicken recipe. I'd like to partner with you, and perhaps we split the profits. He kept getting rejected. But he did something very unique. Um, every time he had a rejection, he would ask, what could I have done differently? Is there any feedback? And he will go back and he will course correct. He will adapt his peach. He would adapt his, his flow. He would adapt what he was asking for. And he kept doing that. Now, it took him about 1,009 rejections before he got the first person who said, yes, I think your recipe is great. Here is the point of that um, short story. Feedback is important. You have to know what you're doing right, but you have to know what you have to change. Um, there's nothing wrong in making mistakes. The question is, how quickly are you failing, but also are you failing intelligently? And by intelligently, I mean the time lag between when you've made the mistake and when you make the correction. You want to reduce that. So rather than walking away thinking I had a great interview with no feedback, if you can ask for some feedback, now some people might be very honest and say, listen, you did a great interview, but I think I would change this if I were you. Take the feedback. Don't just apply the feedback. Go back, sit down, think about it. Find some truth in what they've said and course correct. Let me wish you the best of luck, whatever you might choose to do. And remember this, they're not, not everyone, no one has all the answers. So what I've shared with you are just some of my thoughts and ideas. Find something in what I've shared for you. It could be one idea. It could also be your just understanding being raised, your awareness being increased. But don't just take everything that I've shared and use them. Sit down, maybe study other people, speak to other people, and then based on your personality, based on your dreams and goals, based on your ideal job preference, sit down and take what you think is right for you. Like a buffet in a restaurant. You don't just walk in and eat everything on the table. You have to choose and take what you want and the reason is this because at the end you have to pay the price so i wish you the best of luck um, i hope you do find your ideal job and god bless